Hello and welcome to our church service tonight at Lifestreams Karawara. We're coming to you from Karawara, Western Australia. Wherever you are from right now, we're really happy to have you with us, where you're, whether you're a regular member of our congregation or whether you're a visitor from away or a friend or family member. So lovely to have you with us. Because we're worshiping in a different way now online, we are still wanting to have as much as possible an interactive experience. So we would love you to take part by leaving a comment in the comment section, if you, whether you're on YouTube or on um, the, our Facebook live, live, live stream. <laughs> or you can email us using the email address, which you will see on the screen below. Uh, we just want to stay in touch with you and uh, have that joy of worshiping the Lord together. Thanks for coming along. So we're going to go now into the worship part of the service. And I was thinking this week about how uh, we have people coming from and joining us in our church service now from around the world. And it is so great to have you with us. It reminded me of a passage from Psalm 86 that I'd like to read to you now. This is Psalm 86, verse 8 to 10. Among gods there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. So tonight we're going to be worshiping and praising God together. And we're coming together tonight with Livestream South Perth, who are going to be providing the worship music for us. It's going to be super to be joining with them tonight. Um, also, I just want to let you know before we start the, the songs that later on in the service, we are going to be doing communion together. So um, if you would like to take a moment now to get together some wine or juice or, and some bread, however you normally would do that, please go ahead and get that ready now so you've got it done before when the moment comes. So um, before we start with the songs, I'll just um, start with a prayer. So Lord, thank you so much that you're with us. Whenever two or more are gathered in your name, you're here in the midst of us. And even though we're gathering remotely, Lord, we know that you are so happy to receive our worship and to see us all coming together as one in honor of you. And so Lord, we give you the glory tonight and we thank you for your presence with us. And we're so grateful that we can do that through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, amen. And so now, on with the worship.
There's a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear praises He hears Greetings, my Karawara family. I miss you all, but it's good that we can get together online. I just um, want to share with you one thing I love about Jesus, even though that there are certainly many. I love the fact that no matter what we're going through, no matter where we are, he's right by our side, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. And I just have a scripture I'd like to encourage you with too, which is John 15, verse 15. It reads... I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. I hope that's a good encouragement for you all. And I look forward to catching up with you in person when things get back to normal. 
and I just hope you enjoy the rest of the service. God bless. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I trust everyone is well. This is the time in our service when we pray, we pray together communally as a church, as a body of believers. And what I'd like to do is suggest uh, three prayer topics. And after I suggest each topic, then we'll pause for about a minute and you can pray for those topics at home in your own time. So the general theme for prayer today is, is healing, which is very topical. It's also a very popular prayer topic. Many, many people cry out to God for healing. And at this time, I'd like to encourage us to pray for, for three different aspects of healing. And the first one is just for general health, for people's well-being, and to pray, of course, think of those people that are in a, a difficult situation at the moment, maybe praying for a loved one who's, who's quite ill. Uh, let's join with those people and support them in prayer at the moment. Pray for healing, ask God to show mercy, and go, ask God to intervene in the lives of people who need healing, who need health right now. So the second aspect of, of healing I'd like to, to pray for now and, and encourage you all to, to join me is to pray for healing of relationships. I know in times of trouble, things come into focus and it's a time to think and reflect. And uh, I think it's a, it's a great time to heal, heal wounds and healed relationships. So let's pray for, for healed relationships and uh, tighter bonds between people. Another thing I've noticed recently is uh, some of us tend to complain about the way things are, are being done, the way that our systems are working. And uh, I, for one, think our health system is, is really fantastic in this country, and I am um, really glad that I'm here at this time. But uh, no system is perfect, of course, and uh, the people working in those systems can make mistakes. So let's let's pray, pray for healing of the system, and let's pray that God will bless those that are uh, working in the health system, doctors, nurses, and other health care workers and government officials and others that are involved in, in policy and logistics at this time. So let's heal, pray for a healing of the system and a blessing on, on all those who are doing their best to help uh, out with this current crisis. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I do pray that God will bless all of you. Thanks, Scott, for leading us in prayer. And also thanks to Mark for sharing that one thing he loves about the Lord. Our friends, we're going to share in communion as Karen asked us to prepare at the start. I want to encourage you to really move in that, particularly as we go into this next song. Uh, you'll remember the words from Matthew 26 at night where Jesus gathered with his disciples before the cross and 
uh, they were in their upper room and they were sharing in this way. And Jesus gave some very simple yet profound instructions in which to remember this most amazing sacrifice and this most amazing, amazing love. And so the first thing he did was to take bread and to say, take this and eat. This is my body given for you. Uh, in that moment, Jesus was giving thanks to the Father. He was celebrating uh, that aspect. And then after that, he took a cup and he said, this is my blood in the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of their sins. And they take and drink. So, Lord, we just pray and we just thank you for this amazing sacrifice that you've given us. And we thank you for your amazing love demonstrated in Jesus on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, I want to encourage you just to spend some time eating and drinking together. Or if you're alone, you do that as well where you are. But spend some time remembering and giving thanks to the Lord. And we're going to play this next song, which the South Perth team are going to lead us in. And as that does, just worship the Lord as you remember that wonderful sacrifice. God bless. Dark as my night to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and dressed.
Friends, it's so great to be online with you today. We're glad that you could join us from wherever you are in our city or even around the world. We love reading your comments and knowing where in the world people are tuning in. So please let us know. Say hi in the comments. Type out an amen when you feel like it. Let's try and make this time as interactive as possible. Well, today we're diving back into our series in 1 Peter. And I'm excited to share with you today as we move into chapter 4. Because this word from Peter, written to Christ's followers of his time, is still such a good word for us today. Like them, we too have been saved by God's amazing grace and adopted into his eternal family. This is no longer our home. We instead are residents of God's eternal kingdom. And in a temporary way, we're on mission until he decides to take us home. And soon we discover as we read this portion of Peter's letter that there is a tension that that creates between those who are living outside of Christ and those who are actively following him. For us as Christ followers, we're living with a hope that we cling to, that we build our lives on. And Peter's letter gives us real ammunition and a real understanding of what that looks like. And specifically in chapter 4, it focuses on what a changed life in Christ looks like. So let's dive in and look first at chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Since Christ suffered while he was in his body, strengthen yourselves with the same way of thinking Christ had. The person who has suffered in the body is finished with sin. One of the common narratives of the, the Christian life is suffering. You can't read the Bible, you can't read of the lives of those saints who have gone before us and not see that it's something that we are to expect. A sign of how fractured this world is, how broken it is, and real evidence of the spiritual battle that we're in. But suffering also increases our desire for a time and a place to come where we'd be with Jesus apart from that sin. Now you might think that Peter is always talking about suffering, the suffering that we're to face as believers, but he doesn't do this to be gloomy. It's to point out the fact that this is a real battle. And part of the reality of the days in this life until eternity. We're to expect it. And our ultimate example of this is Jesus. You can't look at the life and the death of Jesus Christ and not see great suffering. But unfortunately, this can often become our focus on ourselves. And we plant our feet firmly in that camp of woe is me when we're going through times of suffering and times of trial. We can so easily begin to complain to God and say, you know, why is this happening to me? God, why aren't you taking this trial, this suffering away? How are you traveling through this time of isolation? For some of you, you, you might be loving it. Time to yourself, time without having to interact with many other people. For others, it might be a struggle. I myself have had moments of struggle, moments in the last few weeks. You know, to know my purpose, to know what to do in this time. For myself in the itinerant worship ministry that I'm a part of, you know, I went from being full steam ahead to totally stationary in about a day, losing dozens of ministry opportunities, trips, events, Nothing for the foreseeable future. And it's so easy to say, God, this is such a waste of time. I could be doing so much more for you in this time if this wasn't happening. But my prayer has been this. Lord, help me not to waste this time. Let me not so wish it away that that's my, my focus, that's my hope. And how often we do that in times of struggle and times of trial. God, if you just take this thing away, 
if I didn't have to go through this, if my family member didn't have to suffer this, then we could be doing so much more for you. We could be so active for you and for your kingdom. But maybe, maybe God's saying no. I don't want to take this struggle from you because I want to refine you. I want to grow you. There's a testimony that I'm forming here that it's going to bring me glory into the future. You have to trust me. Stop trying to wish away the time and trust and embrace this time of suffering and trial. It's in those times that we need to remember Paul's words in Philippians 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. It's very similar to our first verse in our text in 1 Peter today. He says of Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. For Jesus, even putting on flesh was a great act of humility and servanthood. The Greek word for this act described in Philippians is kenosis. It means self-emptying. Jesus emptied himself of his own will and became entirely receptive to God's will, God's divine will. He was laser focused in following that. It wasn't about him coming to earth and being waited on or fanned with palm fronds and fed grapes, being given all the riches and all the glory. He could have had that. But instead he came and he modelled for us what the Christian life would look like in this time and place. The feast is to come. It's coming, but not right now. Right now there is sacrifice and servanthood to live out. And so we too should be willing to embrace whatever struggles we face and submit ourselves to the will of the Father. If our mind is only on ourselves, then we'll not endure hardships. We'll look for the easy way out. We'll look for the least painful way. We'll give in to temptations of the flesh. We'll take the easier, less moral path. That's what we'll do. If, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. That's if you try to live for the flesh. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Jesus is saying here that you can take the easy way. You can do the things that the world says will make you happy. You can try the things that they say will offer satisfaction, but ultimately they won't. And what will you have gained? If you have everything the world has to offer for this short time. Or you could look at it on the flip side and, and say, what do you lose for all of eternity? You're forfeiting your soul, giving up real life for just a temporary shadow of goodness. And that's exactly what Peter is saying here in chapter 4. A Christ follower's commitment to enduring suffering as Christ did is a sign that we've broken away from that sinful life. We've broken away from being ruled by sin. In sin, you don't willingly choose to suffer. You choose the easy way. But if you're going to go through suffering and persecution like Christ, then that is evidence of the fact that you are no longer ruled by sin. Now, Peter's not saying that the Christian followers who suffer have a sinless life. None of us can be sinless, only Jesus. But they are committed to enduring Christ-like suffering and living different lives. So in making that decision, to be finished with sin. He then says in verse 2, you are to strengthen yourselves so that you will live here on earth 
doing what God wants, not the evil things people want. When we suffer for what is right, it's a sign that we've turned away from sinful man desires and embraced the will of God as more important. It's an evidence. If it's not more important to follow and to suffer for Christ, then we'll run at the site of a fight. We'll divert conversations away from our faith in fear of being mocked. We'll hide our faith in fear of the threat of losing our job or losing a friendship. But if our passion is for the will of God, then we will endure through hardship. We will honour God with our lives. We'll remain faithful. We'll not cut and run, but we will dig in and continue to grow all the more, refined by the refining fire of the Lord. That's what Peter's calling us to here. We then move on to verse 3. In the past, you wasted much time doing what non-believers enjoy. You were guilty of sexual sin, evil desires, drunkenness, wild and drunken parties and hateful idol worship. In the ESV translation, it says, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. In other words, whatever amount of past sinning, it's enough. If you've sinned a little before coming to follow Christ, it's enough. If you've sinned a lot for a long time before coming to Christ, it's enough. You can never sin so little that you need to say, oh, I just need a little more time doing that. But that's what sometimes we say. Or maybe we know people who say that to us when we try and talk to them about following Jesus. Oh, yeah, I know I need to get right with God, but I'm just not ready to give up this or give up that. But Peter's saying here, enough is enough. 2 Corinthians 5, in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Christ died for us so that that would be possible, so that we could be transformed. So why would we then go back to the old ways, to what used to be? Peter's saying, don't go back to that old life. You play for the winning team now. You are on the losing team. Now you're on the winning team. Why would you think about going back to the losing team? And why would you even think about trying to play for both teams? Because that's not even possible. You can't hold up Jesus as master of your life over here while holding on to the old life over here, thinking something is too good to let go of. Oh, if I just hang on to this little thing for a time, because I'm not ready to change this and I'm not ready to give up that. Because if I do, maybe my life won't be quite so fun. They're the things that sometimes we can say. But Peter's saying that whatever that thing is, enough is enough. These things can't coexist in your life if you're choosing to follow Christ. Peter lists some of the things that the people he was writing to were guilty of in the past. And I, I can't help but think they're pretty much the same things that we're also guilty of in society today. Sexual sin, evil desires, drunkenness, wild and drunken parties, hateful idol worship. Basically anything that hurts us, hurts others, or we put above God, we find our, our satisfaction in, our security in, our identity in, any of those things. We need to turn away from those. Peter's saying that all of those things of the past, however much or however little you did, enough is enough. Leave that behind. If you're holding on, holding on to something and not willing to give up something, saying, oh, I'll give it up tomorrow. And guess what, friends? We have no guarantee of tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. And surely, I can't help but think surely, 
in the meantime, as we're holding on to things, even little things, we're muddying our testimony. We're tainting the evidence of Christ in our lives that others are looking at. Peter then goes on in verse 4. Non-believers think it is strange that you do not do the many wild and wasteful things they do, so they insult you. You know, our devotion to Jesus, to his law, it's craziness to non-believers. To deny the desires of the flesh doesn't make any sense to them. To draw a line in the sand and to walk away from those things really does quite often open the door to persecution, to mockery, to being ostracised and left out because they don't understand. It says in 1 Corinthians 1 that we will see, they, sorry, they will see the way of the cross as foolishness. It doesn't make sense to them. They can't see the beauty in obedience to God. They don't know the joy it is to have Christ, a joy that nothing in this world can offer that's better. The world can't understand why you would want to save yourself for marriage, why you would want to turn the other cheek when someone has done you wrong, why you would offer forgiveness to someone who isn't deserving of that forgiveness, why you would give up time to study the Bible or time to serve your church. They don't understand and sadly that can result in relationships lost. Hurtful things being said even from family members. Now we shouldn't hide ourselves away. We shouldn't hide our faith and avoid those conflicts. Only being friends with believers and spending time with those in the church and never interacting with non-believers. That's not the example that Jesus showed us. He was at the parties. He was spending time with sinners. But there's a way to participate in those times and relationships that looks different. Yes, they might make fun of you. They might call you out for being boring, make it hard for you to be there. But that's okay because the Bible says that that's what we will go through. That's what we're to expect if we choose to follow Jesus. Peter then continues on in verse 5 and says, Though they mock you, but they will have to explain this to God, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You know, sometimes the sacrifices we make as Christ followers can seem a little unfair. I know I've been guilty of thinking that when I've seen non-believers who seem to have it all. They have great lives. Their lives seem easy and trouble-free. They're prosperous. They're healthy. They're happy. And it makes it look like maybe I've picked the wrong path. You know, they've avoided suffering. They've, They've lived a good life. But what Peter is saying here is, For those who have lived in the flesh and never repented of their sins, they will face judgment and be found guilty. It comes back to what Jesus said in Matthew. What do you gain if you get the whole world but you forfeit your soul? So for those of us who follow Christ, we can see this difference. We don't let ourselves go back to the old ways. We say enough is enough and we embrace the sacrifices and the suffering that come with saying that because we know that in the end, we're victorious with Christ. But sadly, those who don't will be condemned for eternity. It's a sobering thought. Peter concludes this section in verse 6. For this reason, the good news was preached to those who are now dead, 
Even though they were judged like all people, the good news was preached to them so they could live in the spirit as God lives. Okay, now this is a much debated part of the text with many different opinions. But what Peter meant, um, there are a couple of important points. Firstly, the words, for this reason. It's important to note that these are not looking back to verse 5, but they're actually looking ahead to the words in the end of the verse, so they would or so they could later. Secondly, the most agreed upon interpretation is that Peter is referring to believers who have literally died. There's thoughts that maybe he's talking about a a spiritual death or he's talking about everyone who's ever died. But the overwhelming agreed interpretation is that it's believers, people who have said yes to following Jesus, who have died. He's saying that this is why the gospel was preached, to those who are now dead, because instead of eternal judgment, they have eternal life in Jesus. So why go here? One answer could be that the response of unbelievers at the time was that they were maligning Christ followers. Maybe they were saying, oh, look, you, you say that you've, you're waiting for something better. You're giving up all these things, saying it's, it's worth it, but we don't believe you. Because from what we can see, you die too. You die, we die, we all die. So why give up? Why not live it up while you can? But what Peter's saying is that unbelievers don't understand the whole picture. From a human perspective, believers gain no benefit from their faith because they die too. But from God's perspective, even those who have already died, who have heard and responded to the gospel, have a living hope and are living in that victory. So like Paul says in Romans 8.18, the suffering we have now is nothing compared to the great glory that will be shown to us. Peter's word to us is a reminder that even though it looks like believers gone before are dead and done, they are actually alive, more alive than ever, and continue on. So in a nutshell... What are we seeing here in these six short verses? We're seeing two very different ways to live life. One consumes everything. Consumes everything now because they believe that that's it. It's that old saying, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. The other, enjoying a relationship with Christ that, yes, requires a willingness to endure hardship, to trust in God's perfect will, to empty yourself and to take up your cross daily because tomorrow we live forever. I've heard it said before, Jesus died to save us from hell, but not to save us from the cross. The way of Christ is the cross. We share in his suffering, knowing that one day we share in eternity with him. And it's in him that we find our strength to persevere until that day comes. Friends, for some of you today, you haven't made that decision to follow Jesus yet. And I want to encourage you. Take this week, take maybe the extra time you have to to read a gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, and to ask God to reveal himself to you, to show you that following Christ is better than anything this world can offer. Let's pray as we conclude. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much for your word your word that is so relevant to us today, even though it was written so long ago. Thank you for the way it reveals Christ's love and heart for us. 
and gives us instruction on how to live this life. And Lord, though we face hard times, though we face suffering, you give us what we need to persevere. And ultimately, you've shown us that you have promised us a hope and a glory that is better than anything this world can offer. Jesus, thank you for making that possible. Lord, open the eyes of those who are not yet sure if that's the path that is the right one to follow. Show them, Lord, that you have a love for them that is better than anything this world can offer. And for those of us who have said yes to you, who are following, who are taking up our cross daily, Lord, help us to persevere. Help us to not be tempted back into the world's ways, into what the world offers, but to see that what you offer for eternity is so much better. Thank you so much for this time that it is possible to meet together in this way and be with us each and every day, every hour, every minute, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, friends. Please make sure that you comment. Let us know what God has said to you during this time. Give us an insight into whether you have said yes to Jesus. Or if you want to privately message us, if you want someone to contact you to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus, message us through Facebook. Send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. God bless. Thanks, Mel. It's great to hear an inspiring message from the Word again today. So uh, church family, just a few announcements before we conclude. We have got a clip for our children, so you can watch it as a family. That's being shared now in the comments below. So you can click on the link and that will take you to a, a, a video that you can watch. Um, we're doing this because obviously we're not able to offer children's church the way that we normally do. And we do miss the children. Really looking forward to seeing them again sometime soon. So bless you families as you watch that together. I also want to encourage you to get in touch with us if you would like more information or if you need prayer, if you would like support or help, or if you just want to get in touch with the church, please contact us via our email address which will be on the screen now, um, karawara at livestreamcc.com. Uh, or also you can contact us through direct message on Facebook. It's our way of um, doing these communications, is our way of trying to stay in touch with people, even though we're all sort of quite having to stay in our own spaces at the moment. So we would love to hear from you. I just want to remind you also about giving. Thank you so much for continuing your financial support of the church. We have um, Tithely, we're using Tithely platform as a way of giving, and we have just added a convenient and easy way to give now using Tithely's um, SMS messaging. You can message on the phone number that's appearing now on your screen. Send a message, a text message to that phone number with the word give in the message. Um, and that will uh, come back to you with a link, which you can click on and take you through the process of giving through Tithely. If you would like more information about Tithely, we're going to be posting a video on our Facebook page, so look out for that. Next week, we're going to be hearing again from John Bond. What a treat. So he's going to be giving us a message on, is Jesus really God? So that is a great apologetic message. We look forward to hearing that from him next week. So before we go, I just want to Bless you all. Thank you for joining in. Um, there's a blessing in number six that's a favorite. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So Lord, I just want to pray and ask a particular blessing on all those who've joined us today. I pray that you would give that peace that only you can give Jesus. As we go out and face whatever our situation is in life, Lord, we know that our help always comes from you. We turn to you and thank you. And Lord, I ask that blessing for the people now, for all of us, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Bless you, church. Have a great week.